It wasn't surprising that the lorry, who had only been traveling space for a couple of thousand years themselves, had never come across humans before, but they had been delighted to meet another intelligent race, and it was extremely profitable. Because men were still held, mostly, to the planets of their own star systems. Ships traveling between the stars by light drive were rare and ruinously expensive. But the lorry had the warp drive, and almost overnight the whole picture changed. By warp drive, hundreds of times faster than light at peak, the years-long trip between Vega and Earth, for instance, was reduced to about three months, at a price anyone could pay. Mankind could trade and travel all over their galaxy. But they did it on lorry ships. The lorry had an absolute, unbreakable monopoly on star travel. That's what hurts, Tommy said. It wouldn't do us any good to have the star drive. Humans can't stand faster than light travel, except in cold sleep. Bart nodded. The lorry ships traveled at normal speeds, like the regular planetary ships, inside each star system. Then, at the borders of the vast gulf of emptiness between stars, they went into warp drive. But first, every human on board was given the cold sleep treatment that placed them in suspended animation, allowing their bodies to endure the warp drive. He finished his drink. The increasing bustle in the crowds below them told him that time must be getting short. A tall, impressive-looking lorry strode through the crowd, followed at a respectable distance by two Mentorians, tall, red-headed humans wearing metallic cloaks like those of the lorry. Tommy nudged Bart, his face bitter. Look at those lousy Mentorians. How can they do it? Fawning upon the lorry that way. Yet they're as human as we are, slaves of the lorry. Bart felt the involuntary surge of anger, instantly controlled. It's not that way at all. My mother was a Mentorian, remember? She made five cruises on a lorry ship before she married my father. Tommy sighed. I guess I'm just jealous. To think the Mentorians can sign on the lorry ship as crew, while you and I will never pilot a ship between the stars. What did she do? She was a mathematician. Before the lorry met up with men, they used a system of mathematics as clumsy as the old Roman numerals. You have to admire them when you realize that they learned stellar navigation with their old system, though most ships use human math now. And, of course, you know their eyes aren't like ours. Among other things, they're colorblind. They see everything in shades of black or white or gray. So they found out that humans aboard their ships were useful. You remember how humans in the early days in space used certain birds who were more sensitive to impure air than they were? When the birds keeled over, they could tell it was time for humans to start looking over the air systems. The Lari use Mentorians to identify colors for them, and since Mentor was the first planet of humans that the Lari had contact with, they've always been closer to them. Tommy looked after the two Mentorians enviously. The fact is, I'd ship out with the Lari myself if I could, wouldn't you? Bart's mouth twisted in a wry smile. No, he said. I could. I'm half Mentorian. I can even speak, Lari. Why don't you? I would. Oh, no, you wouldn't, Bart said softly. Not even very many Mentorians will. You see, the Lari don't trust humans too much. In the early days, men were always planting spies on Lari ships to try and steal the secret of warp drive. They never managed it. But nowadays, the Lari give all the Mentorians what amounts to a brainwashing deep hypnosis before and after every voyage, so that they can neither look for anything that might threaten the lorry monopoly of space, nor reveal it, even under a truth drug, if they find it out. You have to be pretty fanatical about space travel to go through that. 
Oh, my mother could tell us a lot of things about her cruises with the lorry. The lorry can't tell a diamond from a ruby, except by spectrographic analysis, for instance. And she... A high gong note sounded somewhere, touching off an explosion of warning bells and buzzers all over the enormous building. Bart looked up. The ship must be coming in to land. I'd better check into the passenger side, Tommy said. He stuck out his hand. Well, Bart, I guess this is where we say goodbye. They shook hands, their eyes meeting for a moment in honest grief. In some indefinable way, this parting marked the end of their boyhood. Good luck, Tom. I'm going to miss you. They wrung each other's hands again, hard. Then Tommy picked up his luggage and started down a sloping ramp toward an enclosure marked Two Passenger Entrance. Warning bells rang again. The glare intensified until the glow in the sky was unendurable. But Bart looked anyway, making out the strange shape of the lorry ship from the stars. It was huge and strange, glowing with colors Bart had never seen before. It settled down slowly, softly, enormous, silent, vibrating, glowing, then swiftly faded to white-hot, gleaming blue, dulling down through the visible spectrum to red. At last, it was just gleaming, glassy, lorry metal color again. High up in the ship's side, a yawning gap slid open, extruding stair steps, and men and lorry began to descend. Bart ran down a ramp and surged out on the field with the crowd. His eyes, alert for his father's tall figure, noted with surprise that the ship's stairs were guarded by four cloaked lorry, each with a Mentorian interpreter. They were stopping each person who got off the starship, asking for identity papers. Bart realized he was seeing another segment of the same drama he had overheard discussed and wished he knew what it was all about. The crowd was thinning now. Robot cabs were swerving in, hovering above the ground to pick up passengers, then veering away. The gap in the starship's side was closing, and still Bart had not seen the tall, slim, flame-haired figure of his father. The port on the other side of the ship, he knew, was for loading passengers. Bart moved carefully through the thinning crowd, almost to the foot of the stairs. One of the lorry checking papers stopped and fixed him with an inscrutable gray stare, but finally turned away again. Bart began really to worry. Captain Steele would never miss his ship. But he saw only one disembarking passenger who had not yet been surrounded by a group of welcoming relatives or summoned a robot cab and gone. The man was wearing vegan clothes, but he wasn't Bart's father. He was a fat little man with ruddy cheeks and a fringe of curling gray hair all around his bald dome. Maybe he'd know if there was another vegan on the ship. Then Bart realized that the little fat man was staring straight at him. He returned the man's smile rather hesitantly, then blinked, for the fat man was coming straight toward him. Hello, son, the fat man said loudly. Then, as two of the lorry started toward him, the strange man did an incredible thing. He reached out his two hands and grabbed Bart. Well, boy, you've sure grown, he said in a loud, cheerful voice. But you're not too grown up to give your old dad a good hug, are you? He pulled Bart roughly into his arms. Bart started to pull away and stammer that the fat man had made a mistake, but the pudgy hand gripped his wrist with unexpected strength. Bart, listen to me, the stranger whispered in a harsh, fast voice. Go along with this or we're both dead. See those two lorry watching us. Call me Dad, good and loud, if you want to live. Because, believe me, your life's in danger right now.